Hi. So yesterday we talked about how a metaverse or a second life online in a virtual universe could remove a lot of the barriers that exist in the physical world. The most obvious example would be passports. Um, if you are in a position where you have a weak passport, you can still get to experience more or less what someone else with a strong passport could experience. Simply because if you have enough photography and enough video taken, at least through a type of visual immersion, you would be able to get halfway there at least, which is obviously better than nothing. But, well, we also talked about how this kind of a system may promote diversity in some ways, except that we've talked before about how technology tends to gravitate towards a single standard, especially now when defending that standard, defending the integrity and the safety of that technological standard is paramount and costs a substantial amount of capital and revenue every year. So as we try to move forward in establishing a Rosetta Stone that allows you to understand what is happening around us, we have to realize that the virtual world will have some deficiencies and similar deficiencies, primarily revolving around the, the technical need or the technical gravitation towards a single standard in order to create a sustainable universe. And what's happened over time is something we can see on a micro level in the sense that the content creators are now producing inconsistent quality of work while also ceding influence to the platforms that host them. And the answer is without, if I can't find you, even if you have the best book or the best video or the best article, if I can't find you in a universe filled with 4 billion, 5 billion, 6 billion people, all of whom have accounts and all of whom are competing for attention, it's the same philosophical quandary about a forest and a tree falling in it. So we can see on a micro level that even now, the technological platforms that are able to defend their standards, particularly in the mobile universe, have succeeded beyond anyone's expectations. So Apple is a, is a, is a trillion dollar company. You've looked at Google, trillion dollar company, Amazon, which started out selling books and then leveraged that expertise into a Amazon Web Services, essentially a secure, a very secure cloud-based services, a service that hosts other sellers. That's really where the revenue was coming in. And it all goes back to the ability to defend your technological standard. And I probably don't have to tell you that if you have a, a single standard, that's not conducive to diversity. It is conducive to borders, virtual borders. And so you can also anticipate how a lot of the problems that we have now are going to replicate themselves. And in fact, a passport, even a virtual one, will probably need to have some sort of access. Now, what's, what's happened in the virtual world is that we've been able to bypass all of this simply because we've allowed tokens or money to be the foundation for exchange a virtual universal token that anybody can cash or access. And that's been the foundation of avoiding borders. So what's happened over time is that when you have more and more people coming in into this universe, suddenly they're going to have similar inequality problems you're going to have similar disparity problems within a single standard that favors some countries and some content creators within those countries over others. 
so even though you, you've bypassed the currency arbitrage issue, which is one of the major reasons why we have passport controls, because we don't want people from countries that have weak currencies moving to countries or visiting countries that have strong currencies and then just simply overstaying their visa or illegally settling because of the fact that, that one hour of their time in the new country is worth 10 times what it is in the old country. So we've had in the virtual world this financial foundation that has allowed the perception of equality or at least less disparity. But as more and more people join the universe, you're going to go back to the same problems that everyone else has had. Even if you fix the translation issue, even if you fix a lot of the issues that I discussed yesterday, if the foundation of that society is not based on some sort of cultural truth, or at least a path that consistently gets you to some sort of cultural cooperation across borders, the same problems that exist in the metaverse or in the virtual artificial reality are going to replicate themselves just more slowly. And if you talk about the single standard, you're looking at other countries that of course want to compete using their own standards, their own mobile phones, and their own technology and their own hardware. So what we've really seen within my lifetime has been a race to create a system that can host content securely, then to transition that software into a system that is that can be put into everyone's hands, allowing more reliable data to be gathered in each location. And you put all that together and you have an ideal advertising situation as opposed to what happened in the past where you would have a kiosk right here on this corner uh, that sold a newspaper that some people would buy but not, uh, but not others. And you wouldn't really know if they even looked at the advertising within those you know, paper pages. So as we're moving towards this idea that the virtual world will be easier to create than fixing the problems of the physical world, including problems of inequality, we have to again understand that in theory, a lot of the problems that we have now will simply carry over. And if we end up in a virtual universe that has not physical borders, but borders based on whether or not you have a particular kind of token that can only be achieved in one part of the universe as opposed to another part of the universe. You can see how at some point people would start charging over time, not initially, but over time they would start charging for access into this community in order to gain that token. And so at that point, you would end up back to square one where all the problems of borders, which were resolved by both a single technological standard and a universal currency, initially mitigated. So that's why I keep trying to bring us back to the meat verse, the physical world, M-E-A-T, although I guess M-E-E-T verse wouldn't be such a bad idea either. And we haven't even gotten to the elements of fraud. Let's even resolving hacking. We haven't even gotten there. But what I, I again point you to Ready Player One, the Steven Spielberg movie that foresaw exactly what Facebook would become. And you have to really understand, I suppose, why the physical world has failed in order to <clears throat> resist the attraction of the virtual. And obviously the lawyers have failed, the governments have failed, and the reason is they were set up to fail. This country in America enjoyed a period of vast military expansion that was really based on its geographical isolation. In other words, the Japanese military was only able to bomb a remote island. It was not able to really 
using the, the, the technology at the time, was not able to really make any sort of inroads into the mainland. And at the same time, you look at the Bay of Pigs, you look at the Soviet Union's attempt to get to resolve that problem of defense by going on the offense. And you can see how that didn't work out very well either. It was it's simply too expensive to maintain an outpost, a military outpost, thousands of miles away. And even today, Cuba is one of the poorest countries in the world. That goes back to the idea that the United States, post-World War II, was able to, on some level, establish as close as possible an a interchangeable currency that could be used all over the world. So the foundation of this country's success wasn't necessarily the culture. It, it couldn't have been if we managed to fail so spectacularly in such a short period of time. It really was geographic isolation. Let's wait a little bit here. And the banking system. So you've got, you can see how this replicated, it's, it's just replicating itself all over again. It's, it's history repeating itself all over again. And it's not a coincidence that the technology that allowed surveillance, that allowed, that, it, that is now being used in a virtual world. It's not a coincidence that the kind of inventions and innovation that we're seeing is linked directly to the aims of a security state. Which again, goes back to the United States winning World War II, essentially being the last man standing amidst a pile of rubble and getting to establish tariffs and legal doctrines and you know, law of the sea using its own currency, which it made inter interchangeable. And used to create a stable of allies all over the world. When you look, think of it that way, that it's not the culture that was successful, but the currency, the interchangeability of the currency and geographic isolation. You can see how today, geographic isolation would be a negative, not a positive, because now technology allows you, when you go to war, to attack the mainland of the United States or of any country within seconds whether by a nuclear submarine, which apparently even Argentina has, which it's managed to get without having a stable currency. So think about that for a second. You have a nuclear powered country, but not a stable currency. Okay. You put all these things together. Now you've got this blockchain technology and you're looking more and more into this idea that the lawyers have failed, the politicians have failed, the teachers have failed. Almost everyone in the, in the formal sector has failed, which has allowed people in the informal sector and the criminal sector to bypass all of the institutions that were set up post-World War II to promote with competition against the Soviet Union, which was recognized as non-transparent, to promote a kind of a culture that was transparent and that was more honest. And yet, here we are. We're trying to make an enemy out of China, but it's not working. Nobody really believes that China, which has not invaded any, 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 any other country since the 1950s, is set on any kind of territorial expansion. No one really believes that a country that has created the largest middle class in such a short period of time is hell-bent on any sort of malicious end goals. No one believes any of these things. And yet we have the propaganda that's trying to make us think otherwise. When in fact, we are the country here in America that was kicked out of Afghanistan only a few months ago. And of course, before that, kicked out of Vietnam. So this goes back to winning after World War II, which did not end in 1945, it continued. That's why the 60s were so turbulent all over the world, not just in Vietnam, you had student protests in Thailand, you had them all over the world. And when Vietnam ended, you had an attempt by quote unquote communists, which were essentially non-Catholics, against 
a strain of political influence within the United States that was dominated by the Catholic Church, attempting to increase its influence worldwide, and Joseph McCarthy won. He won in the United States because he was able to ex exclude non-Catholics from many branches of governments by claiming that they were communists, and when you were able to remove people or hire people based on that ambiguous, overbroad accusation, you can simply put in people that are favorable to you and your religion and your church. And then you, when you do that within a system of a civil service system that protects jobs, government jobs, while the private sector does not, you're looking at a 50 year takeover of the government branches in the United States by the Catholic Church, despite the fact that overseas, the Catholic Church lost and failed in its attempt to divide Vietnam into a Buddhist North and a Catholic South. So the Catholic Church failed overseas and yet won domestically. And we know that today, it took 60 years, but we know that today because the president of the United States just met with the Pope, he's Catholic. The majority of the Catholic Church, the majority of the Supreme Court, which interprets the laws, is Catholic. And the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is Catholic. I'm in a city that has a Catholic mayor who won election against somebody else who went to the same Catholic high school. <clears throat> I think only, oh, at the same time that he was working with a chief of police that was also, that also graduated from the Catholic high school with a Spanish surname, though he was clearly, uh, but no, he was, he was not of, of um, Moreno Mexican descent. He was clearly of Spanish descent. So you put all these things together and what you have is a 60 year plot to, re to reverse the institutions that made the United States successful all over, the, all, over, all over the world that were established by the son of a Jehovah's Witness, a non-Catholic, namely Dwight Eisenhower. And we know that Dwight Eisenhower was successful because we just need to travel to Germany and to Japan and look at what they've made over the last 60 years to see that whatever philosophy works, whatever economic plan worked or that was implemented, whatever happened obviously worked because Germany, the average German and the average Japanese person is now more technologically advanced and more stable than the average American. So what has happened? How do you get to that point? And the answer is the same reason why Italy, the seat of the Vatican, is a third world country and a failed state. It's the same reason why the Catholic Church was set upon in Germany, which is called the Protestant Reformation. And it's the same reason why in this country there's going to be continued segregation and continued political wars as more and more people segregate in order to prevent further extension by the Catholic Church into their communities, which almost always results in either secession or an attempt at secession that either leads to war or some other factional problem. And we know this because it's remarkable that none of the founders of this country were Catholic, that it, they came here to establish a republic to prevent a Catholic takeover of their political systems here. And in other words, they saw what happened in Europe, they fled and they established a system that they thought would protect against Catholic uh, nepotism and the power of the Catholic Church, which, is, which they recognized as more of a global institution than an institution that favored its everyone within its domestic borders, regardless of religion and so on and so forth. And this is a particularly, you know, interesting topic because this country was essentially founded on, if you really go farther back than the 1700s, you know, people were here. And to the extent that they stayed here in the 1600s, 
uh, they were looking to, they were, they were either stuck here, but they were the parents of the founders when they came here. Perhaps they might have been stuck here, they had no money to get back to Europe. And so they, they, what they were looking to do was establish trade with Europe, with their European counterparts. So once you realize that a lot of the people in this country that were related to the founders had British accents or European accents, they might have even they might have spoken Spanish or French, you start to see that this country was, you know, was founded on the concept of tr international trade. And some people, some groups were more successful than others. And some groups had more, a better track record. And you can see how that would work to the favor of a global institution that doesn't pay, doesn't pay taxes and that has a consistent track record of promoting secession all over the world, whether it's in Czechoslovakia, uh, Ethiopia, you name it, right? Whether it's, you know, most of the countries that have split up, right? Uh, or the, where you have secession, in almost every case have seceded into a country with a port and a country without a port. So Ethiopia would be an obvious example. I don't know about Czechoslovakia, but that may have just been a philosophical, um, you know, a segregation situation. And it goes back to this idea of, wait a second. So if technology, which is man-made, tends to gravitate towards a single standard, what about thought systems? What about religion? And this is particularly interesting because you know, we talk about separation of church and state in this country. It's clearly not the case. I just told you that every institution in politics in this country is dominant, is, is controlled essentially by one religion. And, you know, we have Sundays off. We don't have Fridays off. We don't have Saturdays off. You know, so, so somebody who is Catholic in this country does not have to choose between his or her religion and his or her and some other way of life that's written somewhere else. And so you, when you think of it that way, you're looking at a system in place that you have to analyze more studiously to, de to determine whether or not we're moving towards the direction of a, of a Malcolm X society or of a Martin Luther King society. Are we moving towards a segregation, voluntary segregation situation because that's what works? Or are we moving towards a m more integrated society because that is what is ideal and yet workable and sustainable. When we look at how much of our lives are controlled by technology, which again gravitates towards a single standard within a political system of vested interests that within this country and all over the world gravitate towards a single standard, whether it's the CCP Communist Party in China, the PAP in Singapore, or the Catholic Church here in this country, suddenly the picture is not so clear. Suddenly a virtual universe without these similar sorts of problems looks much more workable, which is precisely the reason why we're moving towards that direction. Because we're moving towards that direction in order to sustain the problems and the status quo inherent in our physical universe, because we've just given up on trying to fix them. We've given up on trying to fix the problems because most of us, even the idealists, probably think it's not possible to reverse segregation that is, that is now bonded, that now binds people together through trillions of dollars of debt all over the world in order to maintain not just a single technological standard, but, but its expansion and then the underlying regulations and laws that maintain that standard. So when we talk about how poor our cultural relations have been, how, how much our philosophers have failed and how much our lawyers have failed and how much our teachers have failed and how much our philosophers have failed, it all goes back to the fact that if you're trying to maintain the status quo at, at any cost, using an artificial financial instrument, debt, as opposed to say cash flow or taxes, which has to be some, which has to have some sort of reasonable relationship to services and the efficacy of those services, suddenly it all makes sense because you've got a fake foundation and then if you're promoting within that fake foundation only the people that are, have accepted that virtual reality 
which is the status quo. In other words, a less than ideal reality. Suddenly, it makes sense that your teachers would be fools. That your philosophers and politicians would be fools and that your lawyers would be avaricious. It all goes back to the fact that we're not trying to fix those problems, we're trying to maintain them in order to maintain both a single technological standard and then the cultural institutions, the formal ones, that try to maintain that standard within a paradigm of segregation. And the sad fact of the matter is we've accepted segregation. Nobody really wants to fix it because I don't think they can. And that goes back to what I've been saying all along, which is that once you give up on fixing segregation, it's over. You're, it's not gonna, you know, nothing you do is going to work. All you're gonna do is have a, a society based on outliers in order to prove that your cultural institutions are superior to somebody else's. And that, of course, has a capacity for just an, a capacity for obviously invention and imagination and media tricks that Jesse Ventura talks about now. Um, and he talked about when he was running for governor of Minnesota, that the news organizations went from reporting the news to inventing the news for profit. Whereas in the past, you had a society that recognized that news, at least good ones, good journalism would not be profitable, but it had to be something that you would want in order to create a society worth living in that had a future based on an honest, transparent system. And you have to ask yourself, well, how is it that the United States has been so successful, even though it's been failing since, you know, World War II? And sorry, not World War II, since Vietnam, since the 1970s. It's been failing because it's been focused on the Soviet Union, a non-transparent country without a convertible currency, at least in the past. And it's judged as success based on the elimination of that threat. You talked about the Bay of Pigs. Okay, so you go, you go to now to countries where the Soviet Union has influenced and you sort of see the same thing. You see a consistent standard being applied, um, especially with, with respect to infrastructure, right? You've got the hammer and the sickle, the farmer and the worker. But obviously, you know, you've got a system that didn't work because it didn't have the cultural foundations to bring people together under a principle, or at least under a set of principles. That's why religion has been so successful. It claims to establish a set of principles. Now the lawyers and the law were supposed to create an alternative to this system, this outdated system, and they failed. They failed because they weren't able to root out vested interests. And here we are. So the United States has looked successful despite rotting from within since the 1970s after it lost Vietnam. And I'm not the one, you think this is radical. Go listen to Martin Luther King's speech, Beyond Vietnam, that was given exactly one year before his assassination. And that's the, that's the speech they don't teach you in school. Shocker, I know. They teach you the other one, the one that's optimistic. When you look at that, and you look at what's actually happened, it seems to make sense and it should horrify you because it means that if we've been judging our metric of success based on the elimination of the Soviet Union, we haven't been looking at all these other countries all over the world that have been catching up to us that whole time and in many cases surpassing us, including in the quest to establish a culture that everyone can believe in that's not based on nepotism or indulgences. And that now includes China, it includes Japan, it includes the EU. When I was growing up, it, you know, it, it was uh, $1 would get you one euro and 25 cents. That's right. Well, 1.25 euros, right? Now it's the other way around, I believe. I haven't checked, but it just reversed. Remember, if finances and financial 
interchangeability and convertibility are the foundation or have been the foundation of the society we, we live in today, that is quite a reversal between allied nations over the last 45 years. So put all that together and you realize the Soviet Union failed because it wasn't able to establish a culture that was able to attract the major a majority of the residents within its satellites, its physical satellites, its geographical satellites, its, ter its uh, terrestrial satellites. It was it tried, it did so through sports, it's still doing it through sports. It's doing a pretty good job, obviously. It's got the number one Greco-Roman and wrestling freestyle teams in the whole world. It's had that for quite some time. There's no question that that establishes a significant part of the culture, especially given the fact that they've not only defeated <laughs> Napoleon, as, but also Hitler and probably some other ones that we just don't know about. So you can see how the Russians, despite having the Soviet Union collapse, you can see how they've managed to create a culture based on a type of success that favors the kind of society that we now live in. And under someone like Putin, who has made it his mission to root out corruption, you can see how the Russians are slowly but surely rising up along with China and the EU. This should terrify you if you live in America. Within 30 years, the country that the United States defeated, defeated is now mocking the NSA and mocking our surveillance tactics. In interviews with Oliver Stone, a former Vietnam veteran, it's now essentially saying that the Soviet Union, which used to have one of, one of the largest security apparatus, apparatuses around the, in the world, which used to support the Stasi in East Germany, is now more honest and less <laughs> pervasive and perverted than the American NSA. Because, and it's had to do that because of, of Chechnya and Dagestan. It's had to do that because of its uh, sizable but minority Muslim population. It's had to do that, in other words, <laughs> to maintain cohesion, social cohesion. It's essentially gone the other way. The United States has decided that it's going to antagonize its Muslim population. It's going to not only antagonize them with, from within the borders, but outside the borders. And the Russians went the other way. They had to, by the way, right? They were defeated militarily, on a military basis. And they just decided Chechnya was just not worth it. They bought them out. You look at all these things, and it's just incredible that we've managed to last this long. But of course, we really haven't. The Joseph Biden's approval rating is now about 40%. There are cracks all over the fabric of social cohesion within the United States. But that actually takes us back to where this country was initially, which was a country set up to be a trading outpost with the rest of the world, particularly Europe. That's what this real country was really based on. It was based on people trying to trade with their home countries, in this case, Europe, and trying to leverage labor as cheaply as possible in order to do it. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that the private sector in this country, within a system designed to prevent a one party or a one church establishment, from ever forming, shouldn't surprise people that the private sector in this country has been wildly successful at the same time that the public sector has been failing. Because one has been based on a set of rules and regulations designed to maintain political power of one party or one religion, while the other has been based on, for the most part, the idea of getting as many people within its umbrella and within its membership as possible. In other words, the consumer universe. It's just that if you look at the Soviet Union, we know that's not enough. You have to have more than just technology in order to prevail. You have to have a something, a principle that allows you to create a large blanket, a fabric that maintains social cohesion. Even if it's tattered, even if it's got holes, you gotta come back and fix it. And we just don't seem to be anywhere near that today. So we, in order to get that back, we probably have to go back to Eisenhower. Just look at Eisenhower's speeches. They're sincere, they're honest, and they're idealistic. 
And you can't really read it without weeping today about what might have been in the United States.